Welcome to this video series about networking. My name is Bruce Hartbents, a faculty member here at RIT, and I will be your host. To find out more, you can visit BruceHartbents.com or RIT.com. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are working through Chapter 2, Traditional Telephony. And uh, this is going to be part three, and I think we're going to conclude this week and then move off into VoIP. But for right now, this is going to be part three in chapter two, traditional telephony from the Packet Guide to Voice over IP. Now, in the last video, we were talking about a lot of the tip and ring, local loop sorts of things, E.164, stuff like that. And what we're going to examine now is the connection all the way to the right of this picture. So this is the one from last week, and we're going to talk about T1s in particular. And if you take a look at this image here, you can sort of see that we have a lot of connections all going down to fewer and fewer connections, and then finally down to one. And really what that's illustrating is the aggregation and then eventually the multiplexing of all of the physical lines into uh, single uplink lines or what we might call trunk lines. So when we start interconnecting switches or we start interconnecting the central offices, what we're really dealing with is a tremendous amount of physical wiring. And so what we're trying to do is take all of these analog lines and then eventually piles of digital lines and multiplex them into a fewer number of physical lines and these physical lines are going to become logical circuits sharing one single physical line. And so what we're going to do is take a call or a circuit that might be represented by a physical line and map that into a time slot for time division multiplexing into our, in this case we're going to talk about T1s. So the minute we deal with this kind of multiplexing, we have two aspects that we have to deal with. One is the electrical signal that we're going to use to send this and then how we're going to organize our time slots, how we're going to organize this mapping of the physical circuits into the logical circuits. So let's talk a little bit about our favorite uplink line or trunk line and that is the T1. Around here anyway it's still pretty popular. Uh, the T1 is sort of our truck for all of these signals. That is we're going to take all of these calls Put them in this container that is a T1 and send them off to the next central office or the next class 5 switch. At our physical layer, the signaling that we're going to use here is something called binary 80 substitution. And really what happens on this T1 line is that anytime you have a 1, it's a spike in our voltage. And it has positive and negative going impulses. And they alternate. So this is alternate mark encoding. And so that goes along, but what happens when you have a whole bunch of zeros in a row? Well, there's the potential for the circuit to lose timing. And so what we're going to do is we're, every time there's eight zeros, we're going to stick in a one and then immediately have a negative going pulse or an alternating pulse so that the receiver knows that we stuck this one in there. So the receiver knows to remove it. And the whole purpose of that is so that we don't lose timing. But that doesn't really help us with how we're going to put this thing together. Now we'll talk more about codecs in another time, but I may have mentioned previously that the Publishers Telephone Network is based on G.711, which is our codec. G.711 does something called pulse code modulation. Pulse code modulation eventually gives us our 64K, and this is because pulse code modulation gives us 8,000 samples per second, twice our bandwidth, and then each sample is allowed 8 bits to represent the value. So 8,000 samples per second, 8 bits per sample, 64K. Each channel in a T1 is one of these PCM encoded voice channels, or what we call a DS0. So we have 24 DS0s, really what we have is 24 64K channels put together. But that's not really how it's put together. Uh, that's the effect, but what we really do is we take one sample from each one of the channels and put that together into something called a T1 frame. So we have 24 channels 
and each one has an 8-bit sample. So really what that gives us is 192 bits. Then we add a 1-bit for framing, so that gives us 193. Now we do that 8,000 times a second, and that gives us our T1 data rate of 1.544 megabits per second. And here we have a picture of that. So we've got our multiplexer, that's the, uh, the polygon on the, on the left side there. So there you have your 24 physical lines. And each one of those is mapped into our channels. So we have our time slots, indicated here by 1-1, 1-2, 1-3. And so the physical lines are mapped into these logical channels, or they're multiplexed into these time slots. And that's what it's really all about. The FB on the right there is that framing bit. So together, these 8-bit samples, 24 channels worth, plus the framing bit, constitute our 193 bits. And we cycle through all of these 24 channels 8,000 times per second. Let's talk a little bit more about T1s. Uh, we don't just send a T1 frame and then another T1 frame and then another T1 frame. These are organized into groups or collections of frames. So we started off with a super frame. Now we take a whole bunch of T1 frames and put them together into something called extended super frame format or ESF. Remember that uh, each channel is 64K. Now it turns out that you can get away with a voice channel with a little bit less than that, as long as you don't do it too often. So if we were to borrow one bit from a 64K channel, what that effectively does is reduces that channel's bits per sample to 7, meaning that you now have 56K for that voice channel. But what do you do with the bit that you just borrowed? Well, if you're doing that 8,000 times a second, then you have a data rate represented by that one bit. So if we take the example of just robbing one bit in one channel, and we do that in every single sample, then we suddenly have stolen 8,000 bits per second. Or we have created an 8,000 bit per sample data channel. And we can send information using that. And that is something called bit robbing. And this is one of the ways that we convey signaling or telemetry data with a T1. So that's an important idea when we get to a T1 uh, inter-central office, inter-switch communications. This ability to take a portion of the channels normally allocated for voice or even data and allocated for overhead data. Now this graphic here just shows how we have a collection of central offices. We're all multiplexing these physical lines into these logical channels, T1 channels, and then eventually those are multiplexed together for even larger and larger channels. So moving up from T1s, we have T3s, we have OC3s and OC12s, larger and larger capacity represented by these faster and faster uh, trucks. And finally we have some configuration lines here. So if you happen to be working with a Cisco device, which is what we do around here most of the time. These are your config lines that are going to be a little bit special for you. So you've got the, the T1 itself, and we're going to specify the framing. In North America, we deal with the extended server frame format most of the time, and there's our line coding, the binary 80 substitution, and there we create our channel group. But this also brings up the serial interface, and that's actually the, the card that you're going to use here, and that is uh, an IP address that we assign for this T interface. Now you don't always have to do that, but that allows us to route between these guys. T1 cables use pins 1, 2, 4, and 5, but if you're going to connect two routers directly together using a T interface, usually what we do is a T1 crossover, and in that case we're just going to build it according to the wiring here, where you're sending pin 1 to pin 4 and so on, just like you would a crossover cable in EIA 568A and B lines, although these, of course, are T1s instead of uh, the 568A and B standard. Well, that will about do it for us today. Next up, we'll be moving straight into the VoIP stuff, so we've got some very exciting time ahead. We've got our signaling protocols and RTP and things like that to work on. We'll talk about unified communications. Stop by BruceHartBenz.com to see updates, see what's happening, and of course, browse the videos here. 
Thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and may your packets always reach their destinations.